Hello and welcome to our DVD. Uh, this is the one where you're going to learn all about production and audio and lighting for interiors and also how to use reflectors and all kinds of uh, little devices for outdoor applications as well. You're also going to learn a little bit about editing and about uh, lines of movement, direction, actors, all kinds of uh, information before we get started with the actual movie production which is what's going to be for the next uh, 10 or so hours after this. So we are shooting in a uh, New York City style studio backlot in uh, Burbank, California. And uh, to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the video that you're going to see here coming up, um, we primarily use cuts and push slide transitions, which kind of push the, uh, the frame off the uh, edge of the screen. And we use very few dissolves because we don't want to kind of fool your eye into getting into this whole dissolved soft kind of look. So here's our studio, and you're going to see our lights here um, that we're going to be using pretty much for the duration of the, the production. For the next uh, 12 hours that you're going to be watching this production, we're going to be using all of these lights. And also, um, what I'm going to go ahead and do for the next few minutes is tell you about each one of these lights, primarily as a way of understanding the instruments that we're using. So the first one we're using is the RE2000 watt Fresnel. It's stand mounted. It is able to push and get you a really good lux rating, as you can see on the back wall there, from really far away. And then we're going to also use the RE1000 watt Fresnel, which is also stand mounted. The RE650 is pretty much the workhorse of the set. It's the one we're going to use the most. Here's the 650 again from another angle, and you can see how far away it is from the back wall compared to the 300 and the 150. Uh, the 300 watt is great for backlights. It's the, primarily the backlight king of production. The size of the lens is perfect for making a backlight. And then after that, we're going to get into the 150. The 150 Fresnel is going to be the best light that you can use for rim lighting or kicker lights from the sides of the actor and also for spotlighting certain details in the set. The reason being is it's just the right wattage. You never have to dim it up or down. And then we also have the 400 watt HMI PAR unit. And this one, as you can see, produces a blue light on the background as opposed to a tungsten light because we are at tungsten white balance right now as opposed to daylight white balance. Um, that requires a ballast as well, too. It's a complex, expensive light to use, but we'll show you in the next 12 hours exactly how to get the most out of it. There is the, um, the throw of the 2000 watt Fresnel. You can see exactly what kind of uh, spot is generating from that distance at that exposure. There is the 1000 watt spot. You can see how the, the size of that circle gets smaller and smaller. The larger lights uh, not only can throw more light, but they can also throw it over a larger area. So the bigger the light, the more of a spread you're going to get and the longer of a throw. Here's the 300 watt right now, and that's the spread it's going to have on a back wall at about that distance. And coming up is the little 150, which is one of my favorite little lights. Um, it's sometimes referred to as an inky dink, which is a kind of a carryover from um, another company that used to manufacture lights like that. And you can see the large circle that the HMI is producing at that exposure. This is all at the exact same exposure at about f5.6. It's at 5500 degrees Kelvin daylight output, so the lights appears blue when the white balance is set at 3200 degrees Kelvin. The lamp requires an associated ballast, and that ballast will feed the proper voltage and power to an igniter which ignites the lamp, giving us a light output of an HMI that's four times brighter than the same wattage lamp in tungsten. Therefore, with only a 200 watt HMI bulb, we can get the equivalent light output that we would get from an 800 watt tungsten halogen lamp, which would require even more than what this 650 is able to do. The second thing about the HMI lamp is the color temperature of the light is at daylight. In order to match the color temperature with the tungsten lamp, we would have to add a blue filter in the front of the light that would reduce about 50% of the light output. So in actuality, this HMI lamp at 200 watts is putting out the equivalent light of what a 1600 watt tungsten bulb would have to do in a fixture with a blue filter knocking it down 50%, and only then would you have an equivalent. Uh, and you'll see that we use that little kind of uh, symbol, that little squiggly symbol. That denotes approximately. So whenever you see that, it, it says we, we, this is approximately where we're at. The reason being is that you can't really measure exactly what the HMI is putting out unless you actually use a color meter. So there's our model, Laura. She's a very nice young lady. You're going to be seeing her a lot. She was also one of the actresses in our movie. 
There she is at tungsten 3200 degrees Kelvin white balance in that HMI light. She looks blue, but when we change over to daylight white balance, she goes into the correct color. The reason being is that the bulb was intended to mimic the look of daylight, the color of daylight, so that you can use it in conjunction with daylight and fill in shadows that are produced by the sun or in daylight conditions. This fixture right now has 2900 Kelvin tungsten lamps in it, and the camera is balanced for daylight. That's why it looks a little orange to you right now. Once I switch the camera, now you can see that it goes back to its normal white color because the camera's balanced to that level. Uh, now we're going to talk about modifier tests for silks, black nets, and flags. Um, what are all these things? Um, well, a silk primarily is what we're going to see right here. It's kind of like a very soft, thin uh, white material that is used to diffuse a light source and make the light appear bigger to the model. And we're going to see exactly what it does. The net is that black, uh, the black netting material in the back there with the red rim. And what it does is it just cuts down the intensity of the light, but it doesn't diffuse it. The flag, what, it, what it's doing right there with that uh, key light, is it's there to cut the amount of light entirely. It does not allow any light to pass through. So silks and other diffusers enlarge the light source and wrap the light around the subject. They convert a specular hard light into a diffuse soft light. Cinegel number 3026, brought in two or three feet in front of the light source, has a very dramatic effect on the overall quality of the light. It obliterates all the shadows and gives you a perfect soft field. So in all of our tests, the model is 8 feet to the key light, 10 feet to the camera, 9 feet from the back wall, and 24 feet from the kicker light. The kicker light is a 650-watt uh, RE tungsten light. It comes in from the left side of the frame, and it kind of uh, makes an edge around her body so you can separate her from the background. And also, the key light is going to be our main light source, which are all the lights that we just saw in that pass-through of all the RE lights. We're going to discuss every single, one of those uh, every single one of those lights as being a key light. And also, the back wall is, is that actual brick wall. That's, we're 9 feet from the back wall, and we're 10 feet to the camera. Now, for the actual modifier tests, for actually testing the nets and the silks and all those uh, modifiers, we're going to use a 2,000-watt stand-mounted RE Fresnel, which is that first light that we saw at the beginning. So we're at F4.0 is our, th that symbol that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. That's the exposure that's set at the, uh, at the camera. And right now, when you see th where there's the text that says no modifier right there in the center, that means we're not using a black uh, silk or a net or a flag in the frame. And when we use it, we'll actually tell you re what we're using exactly and the grade of it. So in this situation right here, we're going to live video. You can see the model is finally moving. Now we're going to drop in a one-stop silk. Now what's a one-stop silk? A one-stop silk is going to absorb half the light that is being directed at it. So we'll have to make an exposure compensation, as you can see there, with the, um, with the iris dial. And so here we are brightening up the frame, and we're going to an f2.8 exposure where we were at an f4.0 before. So watch this. This is a medium shot, just to really show you exactly what that uh, diffuser is doing. And we're at f4.0 with no modifier. There's no silk in the frame right now. And watch what happens when we drop it in. Everything gets a lot softer. The shadows get a lot softer. You can see her hair better. It's not as stark. Now here it is in a close-up. You can see when we actually drop it in right there, um, you can see that the kind of her face tones, everything changes, the highlights on her face change, but you really can't tell what's happening to the shadow because the back wall is too far away from her. You can't really see the shadow. So we dropped in a white card right behind her so you can really see what's going to happen to that shadow right behind her. So here she is, and here we drop in the one-stop silk, and you can really see that shadow get really diffused. But it's really going to get diffused when we drop in a two-stop silk coming up here, which absorbs four times as much light as, the, as not having a silk at all. But it's really thick, so it really makes a very nice soft shadow. So look at that shadow back there. It is so soft right now. We're going to point it out for you. That's what you're looking for is the edge of that shadow and how soft it becomes when you put in a two-stop silk as opposed to either a one-stop, which is that one right there. You can see the edge of the shadow right there. And we're also going to show you without any silk at all, with just the light hitting her and what it's going to look like. And you're going to really see the difference. Look at that. It's really dark, deep shadow. It has a very definite edge. It's, it's, you know, it's good for certain applications, but for doing close-ups and stuff, it's good to diffuse the shadow a little bit.
Now we're going to start using the black net, which is that black net with the red rim that we saw before. This is a one-stop black net. As you can see, all it does is it knocks down the intensity of the light without affecting the shadow quality or the quality of the light itself. It doesn't diffuse it, it doesn't make it softer, it's the same shadow, it's just more dim, so we have to make an exposure adjustment with the camera. So here's how you use it. If you have a one-stop net, you can actually reduce the intensity that's only hitting her body, for instance, only her outfit, and uh, draw more attention to her face. And here's what happens when we take it away. It's just a one even exposure all the way down. Now here's what, what happens when we put in a flag. A flag just cuts all the light entirely that you're going to see through the flag. It's a completely opaque material. So when it goes in, it just completely flags the light that is actually hitting her costume from the key light. And all you see is just the rim light separating her body from the background. Flags are absolutely fantastic tools. They are probably one of the most useful tools that you have on the set to and, and we'll, we'll show you exactly how to use them to cut light off of certain areas of the set entirely. And I'm sure you've heard the old adage, it's not what you light, it's what you don't light. So what you flag the light off of the background, the, the unimportant parts of the background or the things that are actually distracting the, in the background that you actually flag light off of, those are the things that are going to make a nice frame rather than what you actually light. It's easy to kind of light somebody who's just sitting in front of the camera, but when you try to get light off of things that are distracting from that subject, that's the art form. And we'll show you exactly how to do that coming up here. So the first thing we're going to do right now is we're going to go over all the lights again and exactly what kind of beam spread they have and what kind of a throw they have. So the beam spread is how wide they actually spread their beam at a certain given distance. And also the throw is how intense they are at a given distance, which is the model is, the, is at the exact same spot. We haven't moved her, the light's in the exact same spot, and we're going down the line from the 2000 down to the 150. So here we are, we're checking the beam spread and the exposure along the entire body of the model. We're not doing anything weird there. I know it kind of looks funny, but just to tell you how serious we were, we did this for every single light. So the model is still 8 feet to the key light, 10 feet to the camera, 9 feet from the back wall, 24 feet from the kicker light. Nothing's changed. The only difference is that this time, we reduce the kicker light in intensity as the key lights get less intense. So the 650 watt light, when it becomes a key light, is going to put out a lot less light than a 2000 watt light that we had before. So what's going to happen is the kicker light, that edge light, is going to become a lot more pronounced. It's going to kind of fool the eye, and you won't really know what the shadows are doing behind her. So we're going to reduce that kicker light in intensity by using metal scrim, um, as we progress down the line as the wattage of the key light becomes less and less intense. But that's the only thing that's changing in the frame. So everything else is remaining exactly the same. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how to spot a Fresnel. It means narrowing and magnifying the beam by moving the bulb further away from the Fresnel lens. Once the fixture is on, you then can either spot or flood the fixture by the thermally insulated knob on the rear of the fixture. But that's what we're doing with all the lights. We're exploring their light properties at full flood, middle spot, and then full spot. And then we'll show you exactly how that works. Please remember, again, that the reason we're doing all this is because we want you to understand exactly the, the instruments and the tools that we're using for the next 12 hours of production that we're going to be doing so that you understand when you see a light that we're using kind of to do something in the background, you'll know instantly right away, oh, that's a 300 watt light. I know exactly what it's going to do at about 10 or 12 feet. I know exactly what it's going to do, what kind of shadow it's going to make, and how much I can spot it or not. One last note about spotting a Fresnel. It also enlarges the size of the filament as seen by the subject, the softening the light quality. So believe it or not, when you actually spot a Fresnel, even though it gets a lot brighter and it's a lot more intense, but at the same time, the actual light that is being generated from the actual instrument, from the Fresnel, becomes a larger, softer source. So if you were to, to dim it down or if you were to make it uh, go down in intensity with a scrim or a net, you would notice that the actual light becomes a lot softer. The shadow in the background behind the, the subject gets a lot softer when you spot it. Okay, so here's the RA 2000 watt Fresnel stand mounted as opposed to a pole mounted which is the ones that, that are that hang off of the ceiling these are stand mounted fresnels so this is at f4.0 at full flood we're focused in on our face as you could see from that uh, circular pattern and at her face it's f4.0 f2.8 at her body f2.8 at her waist at full flood this is with a 2000 watt fresnel so when we go in and we actually start to go to a mid spot. You can see us kind of gradually get, <laughs> and the model, of course, is starting to get used to the idea that's a 2000 watt light spotted on her. That's at middle spot right now. 
and she's really suffering under that light, which is why we didn't go to a full spot with a 2000 watt light because it was just too intense. So we made an exposure compensation with the camera and at f5.6 we have f5.6 and a half on her face, f5.6 at her body, f4.0 at her waist. So that's the beam spread on a human being at that distance. So we're going to go to the 1000 watt Fresnel right now, also stand mounted. And at f2.8 as the camera exposure at full flood, here are the stats. F2.8 and a half at her face, F2.0 at her body, F2.0 at her waist. This is at full flood. So when we start to spot it in, you're going to see those numbers really go up. Here we are starting to spot it in right now. And you can see it get really intense. This is at middle spot. We make an exposure compensation with the camera. So you can still see all the highlights and the details. And then here are the stats coming up. F4.0 and a half at her face, F4.0 at her body, F2.0 at her waist. So you can see that when you go to a middle spot with these lower wattage lights, the fall off becomes a lot more severe from the, from, her, from the middle of her body down to her waist. And watch what happens when we spot it. F5.6 on her face, F2.8 at her body, F1.4 at her waist. So it's a really sharp fall off now. So here's the 650 right now. This is the workhorse of the set. Pretty much you're going to be using the 650 more than any other light, um, probably in a small independent production. So at F2.0 camera exposure at full flood, we have F2.0 and a half on her face, F2.0 on her body, F2.0 on her waist. So it's a pretty nice even spread and you're going to find that you use this light more than any other light in your arsenal. So here's what happens when we go ahead and go to a middle spot. At F2.8 we change the camera exposure to F2.8 now. At her face is F2.8 and a half, F2.0 and a half at her body, F1.4 at her waist. Now we're going to go ahead and go to a full spot and you can, you know, I want you to also look at the shadow in the background and see how it gets softer when we spot the light on her because it's really a dramatic uh, difference. I mean, if you can really kind of spot it, see how more feathered and softer it becomes. Here's at full spot and F4.0 and a half at her face, F2.0 at her body, F1.0 at her, at her waist. So it's pretty much negligible at that point. You can just barely see it. So here's a 300 watt Fresnel stand mounted again. So the kicker on the background has been reduced by one stop in intensity to make it balanced with a 300 watt light. Otherwise it's gonna to totally overpower. It's gonna seem like it's way too bright. So we reduced it by double. So at f1.4 camera exposure at full flood, we're at f1.4 and a half on her face, f1.4 on her body, f1.4 at her waist. This is not a light that's designed to act as a key light. It's designed to act as a backlight for which it serves a really good purpose. But just to really show you, you cannot use a 300 watt light as a key light. It's just not going to do a good job unless you go to about a spot or a middle spot. So at a middle spot, we're at f2.0 on the camera. And we're going to look at the stats here. F2.0 and a half on her face, F2.0 on her body, F1.0 at her waist. So we're starting to get a decent exposure on her face. So if we used it just as an eye light or a catch light from the camera, it would actually work really well. But it's primarily to use as a backlight. So when we go to a full spot, um, uh, we're going to change the camera exposure from F2.0 to F2.8. We're going to also notice that her face is in F2.8 right now. Her body's at F2.0 and her waist is F1.0 so it becomes also much more negligible. It's nowhere near as powerful as 650. 650 is going to be your main set light. The RE150 is a wonderful light to use as a highlight or an effect light or to use as a rim light or a kicker light from the side. It is beyond the camera's lens speed and sensitivity until spotted. So at the very beginning the camera is just not able to resolve it at that distance. It's not designed to act as a face light or as a key light. So the kicker light's been reduced by six stops in intensity that's two times two times two times two times two times two. That's a lot. It's been reduced a lot to balance with this 150. So here it is at full flood at f1.4. So her face is at f1.0. The body and the waist are way too low to, to be able to measure with a light meter at this point. So when we start to go ahead and go to a middle spot, we can start to see a little bit more detail coming up in her face right here. And we do not need to make uh, an exposure adjustment with the camera yet. It's still just barely coming into exposure. We're still at f1.4 on her face, f1.0 on her body, too low on the waist. So essentially at that point, we're starting to get a little bit of an exposure with the 150. But when we go to a full spot, the stats are going to change just a little bit. We're going to be at a f1.4 and a half on her face, f1.0 on her body, and then the waist is also going to be too low to measure with the light. So next coming up is going to be the 400 watt HMI PAR light. And a PAR just means it has a different kind of a lens than a Fresnel lens built into it. And you can attach different kinds of lenses to that PAR lens, which will show you how that works. Um, the intensity has been reduced three stops eight times 
with black net to protect the model from bright light. So this is at f8.0 with no lens. So there's no lens inserted into the HMI right now. We're going to start dropping in lenses here, and each one of them we're going to give you the color of the lens. So we're going to change the exposure to f5.6.5 when we drop in the black lens. You'll notice that that lens didn't really do very much to the light spread. It just made it more even. It took away that kind of um, unevenness inside the light, but it's still very spotty. So we're going to go ahead and go back to f8.0 with no lens right now. And you can see how there's kind of like a little bit of unevenness in the, in the beam right there. But when we drop in the lens, it makes it very even. And this is with the green lens. It made it a little bit more of a medium, kind of a medium spot. And this is an f8.0 with no lens again. And we're going to drop in now the blue lens. And it, we change it down to f5.6 and 3 quarter. So we increase the exposure to compensate. Now back again to no lens at f8.0. So all these lenses are absorbing light. They're, they're reducing the amount of light that's coming out of the HMI, but they're making the beam more spread out and much nicer. This is a flood lens. It, it has reduced the exposure. We're increasing our exposure to compensate to f4.0. This is the orange lens. So we're back up to no lens now. And we put in another super flood lens. And we have to increase our exposure to f2.8 and a half. So it's three and a half stops to put in the white lens, but that's the, the nicest, one of the nicest lights that you can get out of that HMI. Don't forget, this whole time, we had reduced the exposure of that HMI by eight times, three stops. We put in three double scrims. So you can imagine just how much output this light has that we're actually not even using. You know, So it's a very, very bright light source. Um, it has to be used with care, but it also can be an, a wonderful addition to your set. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to go to Kinoflow. Kinoflow makes these wonderful fluorescent lights. Um, and we're going to use the 4-foot four 4-bank four production unit with four 2900K lamps. So the Kinoflow lights make great fill lights because they are large sources that create soft, even shadows. And they also generate almost no heat in tight quarters. So you can have a bunch of them in a room and you'll never heat up the room at all. You can also use daylight or tungsten tubes or mix them up which means that if you walk into a situation where you need daylight, blue light, you can put in blue tubes in them. If you walk into a situation where you need to balance with tungsten lights, you can put in the tungsten tubes in them and get that kind of a light. You never have to worry about, oh, I have to gel everything to make it all the same color temperature. You just change the bulbs and you get all the same intensity of the light. Another really great treat is that the Diva lights, which are another version of the Kinoflow lights, they dim from 100% to 0% with a very minor shift in color temperature. And on the reverse side is where your dimming is taking place. You've got a manual dimmer, so you can either dim up or down, of course. There's also a remote dim input where you can put a 15-foot remote dimmer that hardwires, which will allow you to put the Diva light up very high on set and still be able to dim it from the ground level. They also have a two-tube or four-tube selector switch to cut half the intensity without dimming. And also, the production models, they give you control over each individual tube. They don't dim but they give you the, the option to turn on and off each individual tube, which are really the, just the best thing in the whole world. We're using the ballast right there, which is the power supply for the unit to turn on each individual tube, and here they are coming on at the actual unit. And here's one of our gaffers, and I'm gonna tell you some more about what a ballast actually is. Well, what a ballast does in this situation, especially with the Kino Flow, is that it converts the AC current, which is your typical ordinary wall socket uh, electricity, and converts it into a, a higher voltage current uh, which will power the Kino flow and you hook it up like this very simple and then you flick these switches on the ballast and the light goes on so the four foot four bank is designed to be close to the subject it's not designed to be placed very far away but we put it in the exact same spot as we had all of our other lights just to kind of show you what kind of light output and shadow quality you're going to have at that distance. You're going to notice that the shadow behind her is extremely soft, even at this great of a distance. If we got it closer, it would get even softer, but even at, at about 10 feet away from her, the shadow is really, really soft. And we are getting an f2.8 exposure at the camera on her. So it's f2.8 all throughout her body. It's a very even light source from head to toe. It's a really nice, even soft light, great for fill lights. So here's with no modifier, and what we're going to do is we're going to put in an egg crate on it right here. What's an egg crate? An egg crate actually straightens out the beam path, and it makes it go only in a straight line. It doesn't let it scatter to any direction. So here it is on a medium shot, and we're going to put the egg crate back on in a medium shot. 
to show you exactly what happens to the background. So watch this. Here comes the egg crate. Notice now how the background just got a little bit darker, but she's at the exact same exposure. I mean, we made a modification with the, with the, the exposure on the camera, but the relationship between her and the background has changed. So this is without a modifier. Notice the background intensity is very close to her skin tone's intensity. Now watch what happens when you put it on the egg crate. At f2.0, we did have to make an exposure adjustment, but the background is now so much darker than she is because the beam path has been realigned to only hit her. So this is with all four tubes on, and we're going to turn off two tubes right now so you can see the difference in the exposure between having all four tubes on and then turning two off to get to two tubes. So it's exactly half the exposure. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to just turn on and off each individual tube because you always know what kind of a ratio you're going to have from one instrument to the next. So the next thing we're going to go into is the Kinoflow 2 foot 4 bank Diva 400 with four tungsten bulbs. So this is two feet long instead of four feet long. It has four tubes inside it that put out exactly the same output though, they're 55 watt bulbs, as the production model. The bulb curves into a U shape and it wraps around so they can take a large 55 watt bulb that you would normally put in a four foot production model, they curve it around and they compact it into a two foot size. So it puts out the exact same amount of light but it's just half the size of the actual production unit. The Diva 400 also has a very efficient egg crate. So instead of absorbing one stop like the, the one for the, the actual production model did, this absorbs almost no light at all, but it still aligns the beam path so it's a lot more straight and true. So here it is again, f2.8 with no modifier. Notice it's the exact same exposure as before. And here's the egg crate. Notice we did not have to make an exposure change, but the background got a lot darker. So the Diva 400 with three tungsten tubes and one daylight tube inserted to add some blue. Some people like that a little better. They say it kind of cools down the light a little bit. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like when you put in three tungsten tubes and you put in just one daylight tube in there to kind of cool the, the color temperature of the light down a little bit and make things a little bit more blue. So this is with no modifier, with three tungstens and one daylight. And here's what it looked like with the four tungsten bulbs. So it has a little bit more of a yellow, warmer quality to it. That's why some people like to put in one of the blue daylight tubes in there to kind of cool things down a little bit. It's just a technique. You can use it if you like to or not. We personally never really used it that way, but we just wanted to illustrate it to you one time. So here we go. Here's the fun part. We're going to go and actually do some lighting right now. We learned about all of our instruments that we're going to be using. We know what they, what they can and cannot do. We're going to actually go in and uh, do some lighting right now. So here is the set that we had. This is with all the overhead lights on, so you can see exactly where our dolly is. We didn't really use the dolly in this particular shot, but there it is for illustration anyhow. The overhead lights are on for only the behind the scenes camera only, and they were off during primary filming. Just to kind of tell you that only when we do the behind the scenes do we turn on the overheads. When we were actually doing the shot, we did not turn them on. So here's the model sitting there, and you can see exactly where the, everything is on the set. And we turned off all of the overheads right now, so only our lights are visible. And we're going to be coming back to this illustration again and again to show you the positions of all the lights that we use for the illustration. So just to also tell you, this is what the set looks like through the model's eyes. So always be like, you know, nice to your models because all they see around them is just bright lights, you know. Starting with the finished frame and then we're going to go from scratch. So we're going to show you the finished frame, exactly what we ended up with. Then we're going to start from scratch and go all the way up again. So this is the finished frame. This is where all of our lights on. Everything is on, the back lights, the kicker lights, the key lights, everything is on at the same time. So the camera is about nine feet to the subject, and we use the measuring tape to measure that from the film plane, which is the actual lens portion of the camera, is about nine feet to the subject. Now we're going to use a gray card, and the gray card, what it allows you to do, this is an 18% Kodak gray card. 18% um, Kodak gray is also what's considered middle gray by photographers and it has a very direct response or very direct relationship to 50 IREs in video scale. So if you have your zebra settings on the camera set to 50 IREs and you, you know, point it at this gray card and it reads 50 IREs, you know for a fact that this set, this model, is perfectly exposed for that light. You can also use a light meter, like a spot light meter, as our DP right there is using, to take a direct reading off of that gray card. And whatever the reading is off of that gray card, which he'll, we'll show you here exactly what part of it you're supposed to concentrate on, whatever the reading off of that gray card is, that's what you're supposed to program into the camera if the light meter is calibrated with the camera. 
So if the reading, if the, the actual reading of the light meter says, let's say, f5.6, then that is off of middle gray. That should be your exposure for the camera. And also one last point of note is that you're supposed to point the gray card directly in between the key light and the camera. So not to the camera, not to the key light, directly in between. The reason that you do that is so that you don't have a highlight on that gray card that to thinking that it's actually brighter than it really is. But if you point it directly in between the light and the camera, it's always going to give you an accurate 18% gray reading. We're going to go ahead and put in at this point an incident light meter. That incident light meter, this particular Sekonic model right here, allows you to extend this bulb. Um, we're going to see it a lot more later on in the series, but it allows you to extend this white bulb out of its receptacle. And that white bulb is shaped to mimic the human face. The, the dimensions of human face, the way it protrudes out of the actual receptacle. And it's also treated so that it measures the light exactly just like an 18% gray card does. So if you don't want to have to read off of an 18% gray card, you can always take a light reading with an incident light directly from the subject, pointing directly back at the camera. So you put the, uh, the bulb right there in front of the subject, point it directly at the camera, and then you don't have to take a spot meter off an 18% gray card anymore. Now here we are using a Greta Macbeth color checker chart. What the color checker chart allows you to do is to kind of when you get back to editing, when you get back in the studio and you're editing your footage, to know that when you see a skin tone and it's supposed to be, let's say, a pinkish skin tone, what, what in reality was pink in that particular lighting situation? So this has a bunch of different colors that are easily found in nature. As you can see, the painting behind her has that type of green that's in there as well. And her skin tone is also mimicked in the uh, pinkish skin tone in the top left-hand corner. They also have blue sky in there. And when you go into a closer shot, you can really see the colors there. And you can see that when she changes the angle of the lights, the, um, they actually kind of change. So you're supposed to direct that right back directly at the camera. Um, you can also see that on the bottom row is a bunch of neutral grays. Those are all uh, squares that are designed to go from white to the left all the way to black on the right side with neutral gray in between with absolutely no tint or color in, inside those, those grays at all. And the one that's um, kind of close to the middle but right to the right of that, that's middle gray. So if you didn't have a gray card, and here it is in an outdoor situation, if you did not have a gray card in that uh, on the set, you can always just use a Macbeth color checker chart and that gray in the uh, in the, that that gray right there towards the right side is also middle gray, just like the Kodak 18% gray card. It's the exact same thing. So now that we've learned how to set a proper exposure from the camera, we're going to go ahead and start doing some lighting. So the first one right there is on the top right hand side that we're going to see is the brightest light that's hitting the model is the key light. Um, we're using an RE1000 watt Fresnel as a key light from the right three quarter angle, motivated by the China Ball practical. We have a China Ball on the set. We're using that as motivation for our key light. Uh, the key light is nine feet away from the subject, as you can see there from the measuring tape. Um, and it's up three quarter to the right three quarter, which is about Rembrandt lighting. Now we're going to go ahead and shape the key light's throw. This, is, what, what this means we're going to use the flags that we learned about earlier in the program to control what part of the background this flag is going to hit. So here we are. We're going to go ahead and raise the uh, key light. This is the 1K right there. We know exactly what it does from the earlier um, discussion on what the, the 1K is capable of doing. And that's the beam path that's coming out of it. It's going to emit that beam path directly to the bottom left-hand side of the frame. And it's going to hit her right from that corner. It's going to hit her from the, directly from the top right-hand corner of the frame. And that's exactly what the key light is doing just by itself. That's the position of the key light right there on the right-hand side. And it's, going to, it's about 9 feet away from her like we discussed. And we're going to talk about how to shape the throw of that beam once we actually light her. You notice that by itself it doesn't really do anything. Uh, the key light by itself is not anywhere near as rich as all the lights combined together. So we're going to go ahead and use a flag to cut the shadow of the china ball from the back wall. The china ball is right there on the top right hand side. That's what's supposed to be motivating our key light. So we're going to go ahead and use this flag right here. You can see how it kind of cuts the light beam and it actually hit, the light only ends up hitting the flag itself, but it actually removes it from the background. So we're cutting the light from the background to actually mask the, the, uh, the shadow of that china ball from the background, which gives away the effect that we're actually lighting the scene. If you see a shadow of what's supposed to be lighting this, uh, the set on the back wall, it gives it away. So here we are, we're bringing in the, uh, the flag, it's cutting it, and it actually also creates a pattern on the back wall that matches that table lamp's shape, which is really cool and it's really important. So that's why we use that particular angle of the flag. 
here we are again doing it. And now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to also use another flag to cut the stray light from the table lamp practical itself. And all these lamps that are actually in the set, the china ball, the table lamp, they're all called practicals. So here we are, we're bringing another flag to cut the light off of that. That way when the light comes on inside that practical, it doesn't feel like it's also being lit by another source. Then it looks cheesy, it looks unmotivated, it looks like it's lit and it takes you out of the, uh, the effect. So adding practicals on dimmers to keep them below 100 IRE. So we're going to put everything, all of our set practicals, all those little lights are going to go on dimmers so we can dim their intensity. Here's one of them right there, that's a table lamp. And coming up are the other two on the left hand side right there. You can see that uh, ball light on the floor and also that kind of different kind of light that's sitting on the table. And they're all on dimmers so that we can control their intensity. Um, the table lamp is two feet away from the subject. Just so you can take a little measurement, make sure you know exactly how far everything away uh, is away from the subject. And there's the dimmers in action right there. They're just standard seven, eight dollar dimmers that we bought. It allows us to dim the intensity of the practical to make sure it doesn't burn out white. Anything above 100 IRE in an NTSC system is going to burn out white. You won't see any gradation in tone. It won't feel right. It won't feel like it's actually a lamp. It'll just feel like it's just a white blob there. So if you use the dimmer, you can control the intensity perfectly just to make sure that you have exactly the right look to the, to the practical without being too bright. There's the other two uh, that are in the background. We're going to control both of those right now. And so that's burned out. So we're going to bring it down from that burned out look. And we also don't want to burn out the spot that's right in the middle. Anything that's burned out white in the frame is going to kind of give away in an interior like this the fact that we're shooting on video. And we don't want to do that. We want to make it feel more film-like. So we're going to bring it down a little bit so it feels more film-like. So we don't want to burn it out. We, don't want to make, we want to make sure that it doesn't go to pure white at 100 IREs. So now we're going to add a 650-watt Ari Fresnel background light from the frame left motivated by the practicals. So we're going to make like this light, the 650 watt light, we're putting this in on the side. We're going to make like it's being motivated by these practicals. It's eight feet away from the back wall. That's the back wall, that brick wall that we talked about before. And we've already learned what the 650 does from the previous lesson. So we know exactly what kind of an intensity it's going to have. And we're going to go ahead and turn it on here in just a moment to mimic the effect of having all those practicals in the background. And we're, then we're going to go ahead and shape its beam with a flag to cut it from the power box on the, on the back wall. It, the, the fact that there's a shadow there from that power box gives away the fact that we're using a set light. So we're going to put this flag in there right there. And we're going to use that flag to cut the light off of the power box. And that makes it so that it doesn't give away the fact that we're lighting the set. It makes it feel like the actual practicals themselves are lighting the set. And see what happens now? We flag the light off of the, the left side of the frame. It makes it feel like those lamps back there in the background are actually giving off that light that's hitting the back wall. So now we're going to add the 300 watt Ari Fresnel background light from the frame left to bring up the painting. So that's another way to use the 300 watt lights is to use them for effect lights. Now here is the actual position of the 300 watt light and it's uh, the painting that's right in front of it is what it's actually lighting in this particular circumstance. So here we are, we're turning it on and off just so you can see what it's doing. And we're going to go ahead and spot it on that painting. And you can see a spotting and flooding. You've already seen this, uh, this video before when we were showing you how to spot a Fresnel. And we're going to use the barn doors to make it only hit the painting. We don't want it to hit anything else but just the painting. Okay, and here we are turning it on and off so you can see what it's doing. And of course the exposure of this camera, this behind the scenes camera, is different exposure than what we're using in the main camera. So it is a correct exposure. And here's what happens when you flood it. So. We're going to go ahead and turn on that light. You can see that right in that painting back there. It's the perfect amount of light. It doesn't overpower the shot. It doesn't take away attention from her. It just enriches the shot. It doesn't make it feel like the painting is now the focus of the entire frame. She's still the focus. She's brighter. So now we're going to add another 300 watt Ari Fresnel backlight from directly behind her to bring up her hair and separate her from the background. So here's the, the position of the 300 watt backlight. It's directly in line with the camera. So it's directly behind her in line with the camera. If you draw a straight line from the camera to the model, the backlight has to be directly behind her along that straight line. It's 12 feet from the subject, and we're putting it up really high. And whenever, of course, you put up a light that high, you want to make sure to always put a lot of sandbags on the C-stand or whatever stand that you're using to put the light up that high. 
So here it is coming on. You can see it kind of separating her from the background there and bringing up her hair. So it's really important. The backlight is one of the most important lights of the set, one of the basic components in the three-point lighting system. Now we're going to add two 150-watt Ari Fresnel kicker lights from the back three-quarter on both sides of her to bring up her hair and separate her from the background. So here's the positions of the 150s. There's the one on the left, and coming up is the one on the right. That's that one right there. And they're going to hit her from both sides, from behind her body, and bring up the sides of her hair and separate her even more from the background. You don't want these, these lights to become too hot or too bright on her because then it gives away the fact that we're actually lighting her. There's the 150s coming on. And you can see them actually here com coming up in just a second. They're 12 feet away from her. So they're 12 feet each. And they're very low intensity. But you really don't need a lot of intensity in, uh, in kicker lights and backlights to get a good exposure. So coming up here is the first one. There's number one. You can see how it gave her an edge around her body. Even from 12 feet away and 150 watts, it's still more than enough to separate her from the background. It won't make a good key light, but it'll make a great kicker light or a backlight. So the other one, the other one's also 12 feet away from the subject. And here it is coming up on the left side right now. See that? Now you can see that she actually has a hair on the left side right there, which is our left side, not her left side. Our left side of the frame, she actually has hair. It was just black before. It was just part of the background. You couldn't even see it at all. So now we're adding Kinoflow four foot four bank with only two tubes on and a Diva 400 as fill lights from, uh, from the front on both sides of the camera. Now we learned all about the production model that we're using here and the Diva 400 and we know exactly what it's going to do from the lesson that we just passed before. And now we know, now what we're going to do is we're going to put them on both sides of the camera as fill. They just fill in the shadows that are being created by the key light. Now the fill lights are very soft. They're not as bright as the key light. They're very diffused rather than specular sources. They create no new shadows or very soft shadows. Now, what does all this stuff mean? It means that they're very soft, so they're very large sources. They're not very small like Fresnel's. They're not as bright as a key light. They're less, much less intense than a key light, so they don't create new shadows. They are diffused rather than specular. Diffused means that they're very, very soft lights rather than specular, which are like the Fresnel. The sun is very specular. The sky is very diffused. So the sun and sky combination is going to create a specular and diffuse source, just like the key light and the fill light. So the sun and sky combination is exactly the same thing as what we're doing here in the studio. We're mimicking nature in the studio. That's why we have a key light. That's why we have a fill light. The key light comes in and makes the direction of the light. The fill light comes in. It fills in the shadows. So they're supposed to create no new shadows or very soft shadows, which is why Kino Flows are excellent, excellent fill lights. And we're going to see them being used again and again throughout the entire series. All these principles that I'm giving you right now are going to seem kind of bleak and not and hard to understand. But we're going to go into this stuff so far in depth later on in the series. So just kind of hold on and you'll learn all these concepts as we go. So here's the set. And we're going to show you the position of the first fill light right there on the right side of the camera. And coming up is the second fill light on the left side of the camera. That's the Diva 400. And we're using two fill lights because you really kind of want it to fill in the shadows from both sides of the camera. You don't have to use two, but if you want to, you can. So here we are, we're turning on all four tubes on the production model. And here they are coming on. That's a production model, the four foot four bank. We again learned all about that before. And it takes a couple of minutes for the, the tubes to actually warm up to the proper color temperature. We're going to turn off the two side tubes on the outside, one and then two. And it is six feet to the subject. Uh, which means that this fill light is actually six feet away from the subject. So you'll know from the proportions of all the set exactly how far away all these lights are. The Diva 400 right there on the right side of the frame is eight feet to the subject. The reason it's further away is we don't need it to actually be as intense as the four foot four bank. And here they are coming on. Here's the four foot four bank coming on right there. And there's the Diva coming on right after it. So you can see it filled in the shadows a little bit. The shadows are still there from the key light, but they're just a little bit more filled in. They're not quite as dark, as black as they were before. They're more dark gray now. So now we're going to add the China Ball, the final practical, which acts as a motivation for our key lights, direction intensity, color, and quality. And you'll ask those are some pretty big words. What do all these words mean? Direction, intensity, color, and quality. Well, first of all, the China Ball, the final practical that we're turning on, the reason we're turning on as the last practical is just to show you that the practical itself that's supposed to be lighting the model 
is not even necessary for us to actually have it on at all to get a good exposure on her and to make things look really nice. It just comes in at the end as kind of icing on the cake for the entire scene to make it feel like all this lighting is motivated from it. So we are actually copying its direction, intensity, color, and quality. We're copying the direction. We're, we're making our key light come in from the top right-hand side of the frame so it's in the same direction as this practical. We're copying the intensity so that it feels like the key light is about as intense as that china ball would be if it were sitting right there and actually lighting our model. We're mimicking the color. So we're not using an HMI blue light under blue conditions or we're not gelling our light blue. We're keeping it the exact same color as that china ball so that it feels like it's actually the china ball coming in and lighting the model. We're mimicking the quality. So we're making the, uh, the, the actual Fresnel key light a little bit softer so that it's about the same kind of softness that the china ball would have. We're filling in the shadows so they're not too dark because the china ball, when, when it has a table lamp on the left side, is not going to be extremely dark shadows. It's going to have nice filled in shadows. So we're mimicking all these qualities of this light with our lighting to make it feel more natural and more real so it doesn't look like it's a studio lit situation. So coming up here we're going to show you where the position of the china ball is right there. It's very close to her face and yet you know because it only has about a 60 watt bulb inside it which is really all you need to get any kind of exposure out of it. It's not really lighting her. It's just kind of there in the frame. It's only two feet away from her. That's it. That's how far away it is from her, but because of the exposure that we're using on the camera, it's having almost no effect on her at all. Even though ideally in most situations, practicals should be at about two to two and a half stops brighter than the face. So use your dimmers to achieve that effect in combination with a spot meter or a waveform monitor, which means what you're going to do is make sure that that practical, when you, when you measure it with a spot meter, is about four times to four and a half times brighter than the person's face, the model's face is in the shot. Then it'll feel real. It'll feel like it's actually you know, lighting her. So when we take a spot reading off of her forehead and her forehead reads f5.6 and we go ahead and we take a reading off of the practical itself and that read that should read f11. So it's about two stops brighter, it's about four to four and a half times brighter than the model and if it is that then it will feel like it's actually lighting her. It'll feel genuine. If it's any dimmer than that it's not gonna feel real. It's not gonna feel like it's actually lighting her. If it's any brighter, it's just going to burn out white like that. You're not going to have any detail in it. It won't feel like it's a real light source. It'll just feel like it's just a, a blob of, of circular white that's just sitting up there in the right-hand side of the frame. It won't have any definition in it. So now we're going to add the Kinoflow Diva 200 filler light from below and in front of the camera to bring up her face and her clothing. This is a filler light. A filler light is not the same as the fill light. It does not come from eye level or from the side of the camera but from below the camera and it's very dim. Um, what it's going to do is going to bring up her clothing a little bit and her and her eye sockets, fill in the eye sockets. There's a position in the set of the filler light. It's sitting on a Matthews Apple box and you can see the Apple box right there and you can see how we've got the bottom flap of the Diva 200 covered up and we have the actual egg crate in there which straightens out the beam path so it only hits her. It's five feet away from her and the, uh, the Diva 200 is dimmed down a little bit. It's not at full brightness because it, this is not something that's going to go ahead and make a major effect, but it's a very, very subtle effect. And here it is coming on right now. You can see it here in just a moment, right there. You can see just kind of filled in her eye sockets a little bit, filled in her, her clothing, made the exposure a little bit more even from kind of from head to knee. So that's the filler light, not the fill light. The fill light was the one that we discussed before. Now we're going to add a light panel LED battery operated compact light as an effect light to bring up the backpack in the center of the stage. There's a backpack there but you can't see it. And so we're going to add this LED light right there and it's going to hit that backpack that's right next to it on the left side and to kind of bring it up so you can actually see it in the frame. Now our light panel was 5500 degrees Kelvin daylight balanced so we added half CTO which is color temperature orange gel to lower the color temperature to the tungsten balance so it matches the rest of our lights. So here we are, we're putting it in, we're dimming it up and down to show you exactly what it's doing to the backpack. And here it is in the background right now. We're just going to cut to it because we have to, have to actually have somebody walk in and do it. There it is. So you can see exactly what it's doing. That backpack was just kind of like a silhouette before and now it has some light on it. So turning off our key light is going to draw attention to the kicker lights and the fill lights and it creates more ambiance and subtle mood. So we're going to turn off our key light. 
Now, see, that makes things more like it has a nicer ambiance to it. It feels more natural. But just don't forget, her skin tones now are very, very dark. They're way too low. Now we're going to turn off the fill lights. There's one. And coming up is the other one right now. There's the other one. Now we're going to turn off the filler light, which is the one that's pretty much at her feet below the camera. And there goes the filler light. So she's completely in silhouette right now. This is what you'd be doing if you had an interview with somebody that didn't want to reveal their identity or something like that. That's how you do it. You'd light the background and you put in some backlights and some rim lights. And that's pretty much it. You can cover their identity. You can't tell who it is. But at the same time, you can still see the picture and you can still see that they're moving their mouth and actually talking to the camera. So now we're going to turn on the kicker lights. Those are the three-quarter back left and right lights that bring up her, her hair and they outline her body against the um, background. There goes the other one right there. Now we're going to turn off the backlight, which is the light that's directly behind her up high. There she goes. Now she's completely in silhouette, no light on her at all except for the practicals. There goes the effect light on the painting, that 300 watt Fresnel that we saw before. Now we're going to turn off the background light, which hits the back wall. There goes the background light. So you just see her with nothing but practicals now. Now we're going to turn off all the practicals. There goes the first two. And here goes the china bowl. And a table lamp. The only thing we have left was just that bag lit. So the practicals have some or no effect on lighting the scene. They act as motivation for almost all of our interior lighting choices. But they don't actually light the scene usually. If you'd arrived on the set and you'd done no lighting but simply used the practicals and turned up the camera's picture gain adjustment at 12 decibels, so you just gained up, this is what kind of an image you're going to have. Okay, coming up here, we're just kind of moving around the set trying to get the lights going. You can't really see very much at this point. <laughs> That's what you need your mag lights for, your little flashlights. Kind of walk around the set when it's all dark like that. There comes the first practical right there on the left side. And coming up the rest of the practicals. We're doing them all real slowly, so you can see that we did this all live. We didn't do any kind of trickery in post or anything, or didn't overlap frames in post. This is all live as you see it. So there's the third practical right there. The only time we might cut a little bit is just to kind of absorb a little bit of time. If it, if it just rolls on too long, we'll cut, you know, just to, to show the actual light coming on. Here comes the last one. That's the actual china ball. And now what we're going to do is we're going to turn up the picture gain on the camera to 12 decibels of gain. And you can see it right there. It's starting to come up right there. You can start to see an image. Um, this is at full wide exposure. And here comes the gain right there. And this is the maximum gain that we have with this camera with no neutral density. And this is a very sensitive camera, but it, it can barely see an image. Um, and in stark contrast to our lit scene, which looks really nice and you know the ambiance is really nice. It's just a really nice image, uh, a very nice scene. And then here you have it. It's kind of, to me, it almost looks like it belongs in a horror film or something like that. Uh, but it just that's just my opinion. Some people like this look. You know, they really like that kind of look where the burned out practicals. But, And sometimes I do too. I mean, if I'm shooting something that's correct for that type of mood, I will use that type of lighting. But for, mo for all intents and purposes, most of the time, you're going to want to shoot a nice image or a nice picture that's well lit. You can see everything in the frame, but you can only see certain things that you want to see. That's what you need lighting for. So now that we've shown you the right way and another way to do it, we're going to show you the totally wrong way to do it. This is the dreaded double shadow on the back wall and her neck using flat lighting with two specular sources on both sides of the camera. And we're also new using no fill light, so the shadows are going to be very dark. Now the dreaded double shadow means that there's two major shadows behind her head, which means that there's not just one shadow anymore that is created by one key light. There's two shadows, one of them completely unmotivated, which is just kind of coming out of the out of thin air. Just uh, nobody knows where this light is being positioned and why it's actually affecting her her face in this way or why it's creating that second shadow on the back wall. But you really want to try to avoid having two uh, two or like a secondary shadow on the back wall, unless you have motivated two very specular sources, two hard sources in the room, like two bare bulbs that are supposed to be creating two major shadows on the back wall. If you establish that, then you can use it. But if you didn't, try not to do that. Um, and I also just want to let you know that the DP has 100% asked me to, to tell you that he would never light the scene like this normally. It's just because we're trying to show you the wrong way to do it. So, And also the model was asked to move around to illustrate the shadows on the back, on the back wall. So you're going to see her kind of goofing around there, uh, acting all silly, jumping around. And that's because we asked her to move around to show us exactly where the shadows are. Because when she's still, you can't see him. There's the first one. 
There's a second one right there. And you can really see it when we turn off the other light. You can see the other one kind of coming on and off. It's just wrong. This is like totally wrong lighting. You don't want to do this. This is very amateurish. Um, unless you're doing something very specific that is you're motivating these two lights from practical sources. And they're supposed to be like that. So here's an accelerated setup from scratch to finish. We're going to show you how we did everything from the very beginning all the way to the end. That's what we started with. And we had a very, very patient model. She is very, very patient. Sat through all the stuff for hours and hours and hours. Did not complain. So you, can, you see her a lot in the movie. She's one of the, uh, the stars in the movie. Uh, actually, I guess you already saw the movie at this point. But you'll see her a lot in the making of the movie. Um, you know, all the behind the scenes and everything. And, you know, us working with her. There's that uh, China ball kind of wiggling in and out there trying to find its place. And... There's the background light being adjusted. Turn everything off. Turn it on. Start from scratch with nothing but the practicals. There's the practicals coming on. There's the background light. The effect light for the painting. The backlight. The kicker light on the left. Kicker light on the right. Filler light. Fill light on the left. Fill light on the right and the key light. There's the, the key light. So that's it from start to finish. So you can see exactly where we started with and where we ended up. Um, one of our patented approaches to teaching. So you can really see exactly how we do everything. Um, you'll find that for the rest of the series, we're going to mask no struggles. Which means we're going to show you all of our struggles, everything we have to go through to achieve everything. And hopefully you'll learn from that principle. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is lighting ratios for just a minute or so. Um, key to fill, key only. This is just lighting her on a close-up with just the key only without using the fill light. And we're going to bring up the fill at 3 to 1 ratio. So we're just dimming up the fill just a little bit to fill in those shadows that are on the right side of her face. And now we're going to change to a 2 to 1. You'll notice that the shadows are more illuminated now. It's less of a contrasty type of image. Now we're going to go to a one and a half to one here in just a second. There's a one and a half to one. You see this even more light in the shadows lighting the frame. That looks really nice. It's very pleasing for video. It looks really nice for the format that we're shooting in. Um, so lighting ratio primarily is adjusting the fill light in relation to the key light. The key light is at a very fixed intensity. It's at that intensity. Then you bring in the fill light to fill in the shadows from the direction of the camera slowly until you hit that perfect kind of ratio that you're looking for. Most of the times, 2 to 1, 1 and a half to 1 is really great for video. If you're going for a very cinematic look, a more high contrast look, you might stop down to like a 3 to 1 or a 4 to 1 kind of ratio, which is more of a ratio from the key to the fill. So the fill becomes half as bright as the key at a 4 to 1 ratio. Not 2 to 1, but 4 to 1, it's half as bright as the key. That's, that's pretty much the maximum that you'd want, but you always want a little bit of fill somewhere in the, in the frame to bring up those shadows a little bit so they're not too dark. So now that we've seen how to light one person, we're going to go ahead and see how to light two people sitting in a, uh, in a certain space. Um, in this case, we're still in the same studio. We just moved to a, a different part of it where we can see a white back wall instead of the uh, brick wall. And what we're going to see is uh, two people also with two different skin tones. He's obviously going to be darker than her, and she's lighter. She's more fair-skinned than he is, so which is going to also show you how to work when you have two different actors that have two different skin tones, one darker than the other, and how to put them both in the same frame and not have one be too light and one be too dark and have too much of a difference in the exposure between their faces. We're going to show you how to position a soft key light um, kind of closer to the darker-skinned person so that you can kind of balance both of them in that particular, in that particular method. Um, what we're also going to talk about is exposure. We already talked about exposure a little bit um, and how to take an incident light reading before with that incident light meter that has the bulb sticking out. Um, but also we're going to talk about how to take a contrast reading, which means reading individual lights by making that bulb kind of go back into its receptacle to read individual lights and check a lighting contrast, which is a lighting ratio between key to fill to other lights. So here the DP is taking a reading off of her face. Now this has the bulb out. You can see that it's actually sticking out of the, the meter and he's taking the reading off of his face. That just gives you general lighting at that particular position. 
So when the bulb is sticking out, it's taking in, factoring in all the different lights that are actually hitting the actor from the front towards the camera. Um, and here he is taking it from a lot of different directions, from the bottom, from the top, um, and kind of just getting an overall light reading. But when he shrinks it back in there, when he puts the, the, the white bulb back into his receptacle, um, he's taking a reading of only that particular light that is facing the, uh, the meter at that point. So the meter will actually give you a reading of just what that light is doing and what kind of output it's having at that particular distance from it. So now let's talk about lighting. Um, this is something we've been waiting to do. This is lighting two subjects sitting in the frame. Uh, the actors are about six feet to the camera. And the reason we're telling you that is just so that you always know exactly how far away the actors are from the camera for us to achieve a certain effect with our lens that, we, that you're seeing in front of you. So we want to always try to make sure to tell you how far away the subjects are from the camera. So the first thing we're going to do is soften the practical bulb. The uh, practical that's sitting in the middle of the frame, which we already learned about practicals in the last uh, session, um, is just emitting a light that is a little bit too harsh because the bulb inside it, you can actually see the filament. Um, the, the glass that we're using is almost clear glass. So what the DP is going to do, he's going to go ahead and get some diffusion. And by all means, I don't recommend cutting gels the way that he's doing it right there. Uh, but he's been doing it that way for years and he's not about to stop and he just likes the way that uh, he likes doing it that way. I always recommend using scissors if you can. Please use scissors. Do not use a knife. Um, it's a lot less dangerous than using a knife. So here he is putting in the diffusion right there into the actual uh, practical. And you can see what it does to the light. It just really softens it, makes it a little bit more mellow, takes away that spot in the center of the frame that takes up all of your attention. Because the first thing that you see when you see the frame without that diffusion is just that spot in the center of the frame takes the attention away from the performers. So he's going to go ahead and put in, he just doubled up the diffusion right there, make it even thicker, and you just put it in there. So to check fill will improve your lighting, bring in a small reflector or foam core and test it before committing a large soft light. So before you bring in a huge soft light and put all the effort into it, um, just bring in a little piece of foam core and see if it's actually helping at all before you actually bring in any kind of a soft source. Because we were going to add a soft light right there, but then we brought in this foam core and realized that we didn't really need to do that. It wasn't really taking away or doing anything by not putting it in there, so we just scrapped it. So the key light for both actors at position one is five feet to the subject. It's the same instrument as the fill light, but dimmed up brighter. They're both Diva 200s. They're these little Diva 200s that have two tubes. We learned about them in the last series, in the last session, I mean. And they're just only two tubes, Kinoflow fluorescent lights. They're dimmable, and we have those uh, warming gels on them. So they're five feet away from the subjects. And what I mean by warming gels is about half CTO. That's color temperature orange. We learned about those gels a little bit ago. What they do is they just warm up the light a little bit, make it more orange and a little bit less blue. So they lean it towards the red more so it becomes more orange. And it creates a light that feels like it's being motivated from our practical lamp, which is really important. We also learned about that in the last session, that it's really important to motivate not just the direction, but also the color of the light with your key light to make sure that it matches the practical light that's supposed to be lighting these two actors. And we're going to really get into that here as soon as we get into the actual breakdown of the lighting that we did. But just to mention also that notice how we're moving in the key light closer to the actor. He has darker skin than our actress who's more fair skin. So the key light has to be closer to him to balance out with her lighting. Um, also at the same time, don't forget that both of these lights are identical. Uh, they're both Diva 200s. They both put out the exact same amount of wattage. Um, so the best way to use a key fill combination between both of those two lights, because we wanted to use both of them, is to make sure that one of them is just dimmed down more than the other one. So one of them we dimmed down to 50%, and the other one we dimmed up to 100%. So one of them is at full 100% intensity, the other one's down to 50%. Therefore, the brighter one is going to be the key, the less bright one is going to be the fill. So now let's talk about the fill light. The fill light is exactly the same distance as the subject as well too. It's also five feet. So they're exactly the same distance. The only difference between them is that one of them is 50% intensity. That's the fill light. The key light is a full 100% intensity. And see how we're attaching the CTO, uh, the color temperature orange, half CTO gels to it to make it warmer, to make it more orange, uh, make it match that practical lamp. We're five feet to the subject. So the kicker for the actress is 14 feet away. 
And that's, of course, a 300-watt RE. We talked about the 150s and the 300 making the best um, backlights and kickers. So here it is being swung in. See, there's a flag on the right side that we're adjusting there to make sure that the light from the kicker only hits the actress but not the actual tabletop. Like we said, mentioned before, that's what flags are there to do. They're there to shape the light. So the actor's key at position two is 13 feet to subject. Now, what does that mean, actor's key at position two? A key light is supposed to be a key light, but that's position two right there, which he actually eventually gets away from the table and he starts hovering around in that area over there. There he is, he gets away from the table and he starts hovering around in there, kind of walking around in that area that we made for him earlier with the spike marks. Well, he needs a key light there because the key light from position one is not gonna extend all the way back there. And yet you see the shadow back there, it's still making it feel like the light's coming from the key light because it's still maintaining the major shadow. But we still have to get him some kind of light on him in that position so you can separate him from the environment. And that's what that um, key light at position two is. Notice that there's a little bit of a modifier in front of that light. That's called a cookie sheet or a cucoloris. And what it's designed to do is break up the light's pattern so it feels more natural, kind of like it's going through tree leaves of some, of some sort, like an outdoor light. And even though you can't actually see the actual pattern on the floor because we framed it out, it makes it feel like when he's walking through it, like he's walking through multiple different streams of light. Um, and it kind of makes it feel like um, the motion is more pronounced. And here we are remeasuring the distance to it to make sure that we know exactly how far away it is. And that's why we're able to give you that measurement. And we flagged his key off the background to maintain proper contrast level. So watch how we're gonna do that. See that flag on the left side? That's gonna go ahead and watch the background. It's gonna go ahead and flag the light off of the background. Doesn't give away the effect that we lit him from a different position. So again, I like, you know, I'm going back and saying, flags are gonna be the most important modifiers that you can have on the set just about, because what you don't light is almost more important than what you actually do light. Flagging stray light off of the background is gonna give you a much nicer frame than just concentrating on the subjects in the foreground for six hours. So this is gonna be the actress's kicker light, which is nine feet to the subject. Um, what it's doing is gonna bring her up and separate her from the background without affecting um, the actor next to her. So here comes the DP, and he's bringing in a black net. Um, this is a double black net. It has a red rim, which means that it's a double. It reduces light intensity by a full stop, which is double. So it halves the amount of light that goes through it. If you put in 300 watts through it, you're gonna get 150 watts on the other side. He's putting it in front of this 300 watt RE right there, and he's gonna feather it so that it only hits her and it doesn't hit the actor. But we don't wanna block it completely. We want it to still hit him a little bit, but we don't wanna block it completely. That's why the flag is there. The flag is, to, is there to block it from the table, but the actual scrim or the net is there to only make sure that it only hits her at full intensity and hits him at half intensity. So the actress kicker at position two is nine feet away from the subject. At position two, that's when he's walking around back there. And we wanted to also separate him from the background on the right side of the frame. So we're using an RE150, it's nine feet away. And watch when he gets up right there, you can see as we're showing you the highlights that are coming in on the side of his body from that light path, that's where the kicker's coming from. And it's illuminating him back there when he's standing around and separating him from the background. It's giving him an edge light on the right side of his body. Now the background light is six feet away from the background. That's the one that hits the back wall, like the one we saw before in the last session. Uh, this one is also a four foot four bank, which creates that really nice kind of flood area um, on the back wall uh, without any spots at all. That's the beauty of that Kinoflow. So and if you're using expensive roll gels and you don't want to cut it, just lay the entire roll down in the instrument like the Kinoflow four foot four bank, uh, just like that. And that way you don't have to actually cut it. You just roll it on there. And then when you're done with that shot, you just roll it back up onto the spool. Uh, that way you don't have to cut it every single time into little pieces. And you can see it right there, that CTO, that's half CTO again right there, making that light in the background really nice and orange. And what it does is it matches it with the foreground practical that's dimming up right there. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go around the whole set and we're gonna turn on all the lights and turn them all off. So uh, we're gonna go back to scratch right here. There comes the uh, key light that just came on. And we're adjusting the intensity of the, the camera right there to compensate for it. There's the fill light over there. And here it goes off. And here it comes back on. That's the fill light right there. That's that other Diva 200 off to the left side. There it is off again.
and there it is back on again. We're going to keep doing this again and again until everybody gets exactly how we did this. And here comes the key light that's off. off and then here it is coming back on and off again and off again you can see exactly what each one is doing I want to make sure that you guys get exactly the separation of duty here between every single one of these lights now here comes the uh, the kicker light back there watch her watch her face right there it's a very minor change but you can see it in her hair it separates her hair a little bit from the background we didn't want a lot we just wanted a little bit it's been uh, black netted off of him it only hits her and the DP is walking around right now to the other uh, kicker light. And you're going to see what that does. That's a little bit more of a change. You can see that in the left side of her hair right there. It's very subtle. We don't want to overpower that foreground practical. We don't want to make like really bright lights. We just want it to feel natural and separate the actress from the environment, from the background. So here goes position two right now. Now the actor is in position two. And we're turning on and off his key light at position two, so you can see exactly what it's doing. There's the DP right now with the key light. You see that? He just kind of is immersed in darkness right there. It doesn't feel right. Uh, that light, if you were in a situation like that, would extend back there. You'd still see something back there if it was real life. Now here's his kicker at position two. You can see what it's doing right there. See that? It's making an edge on his body right there. And again, now this is her kicker at position one. And let's see what else the DP is going to go for right now. He's going to go for the background light. And we're going to see from the camera what the background light looks like when it goes down. And we're going to do it one tube at a time right there. There we go, all the way down. There's no continuity anymore from the foreground to the background. It just feels like it's just foreground light. But if you were in a situation like that, the light from that foreground practical would extend to the background. So you have to extend the emotion to the background. So let's go ahead and talk about turning all the lights off until we end up with just the practical right now. So here we are, we're turning off all the lights. There goes the background light right there. And the only thing that's left is just his key light at position two. And we're gonna end up with just the practical. So you can see that the practical by itself is emitting practically no light. That's what practical ought to stand for, no light. Practically no light. Uh, no, actually there are other situations where you would use a practical to light people, but not in this one. So here we are, we're turning everything back on now. So you can see what every light is doing really quickly. And there goes the background light. Now we're going to do it one more time, but just end up with only the practical and the background light only. So you can see the, the importance of, of continuity between the foreground practical and the background uh, light that we added to the shot and how important it is to have lighting continuity in direction intensity and color right there they're nothing but silhouettes all it is, is just a background light and the foreground practical see how much control you have over your set when you start lighting you can make just about any mood that you want on the set when you understand where all the lights are coming from here comes her kicker lights are coming up right now and we're showing you where everything is right there you see all those lights that are hitting her those are her kicker lights and his kicker light as well too now we're watching the monitor right there as we turn on the key light. There's the key light. And it illuminates both of them and it makes a shadow on the back wall as well too. Which makes it feel like that that's the shadow that's coming from the, um, from the foreground practical. And you see that shadow when he moves around, it moves around. So it feels like it's actually coming from that foreground practical, not from the other key light that's on him right now from the left side. We're turning it on and off. Now, using the simple key plus fill plus backlight, just basic three-point lighting in this case, does not match the practical lamp in the foreground. It is acceptable but unmotivated and thus takes away from the scene. So we're going to show you a simple key fill backlight. If you just walked in on the set and you just popped up three lights and didn't really want to motivate them from the, uh, from the foreground practical, we're going to show you what that looks like. So we already showed you the right way, showed you the wrong way. We're going to show you another way right now. So here it is with just nothing but the practical and we're starting to turn on the lights. There's just a, a key and a fill and a combo and a slash on the background. So this is what it would look like with just three point lighting with a specular uh, key source and a soft fill source and just a slash against the background, just basic video lighting. And that's what it looks like from the other side, from their side. So this is if you didn't bother to motivate the lighting from the actual practical itself 
uh, didn't bother with the color of the, the light, the practical, didn't bother with the color of the light extending into the background. That's what it would look like, just basic video three-point lighting. There's the key. And now, this is at 18 decibels gain. If you showed up on the set, you didn't want to do any lighting, you just wanted to go ahead and just actually overdrive the gain on the camera and just use the practical light. That's what it would look like. And there's a nice slash across the background. It looks really, really nice. Very romantic. 